thank you for joining us, everybody, for our webinar on EDGE. The session will be uh, the session will be Dahlia Adib, Senior Consultant at STL Partners, and then Jason Hoffman, who is Chair of Mobile EdgeX and has recently been named as one of the 50 top edge influencers in the Americas. Then we'll have a Q&A. We'll send a recording of today's session out after the event too, which we encourage you to share with your colleagues. You should see a control panel on the right hand side, which you can expand or hide using the orange button at the top, which is next to arrow one. And there is a questions and chat box in the control panel. So please type questions or comments there and we'll go through these at the end for the Q&A. We may ask you to raise your hand. And if so, you can do this by using the hand button, which is indicated by arrow two. All attendees are uh, muted, so um, please use the um, the chat box to reach us. We are advised that the best sound quality is through a USB connected headset. If you have problems with sound, please try adjusting your vo volume settings locally, and if necessary, sign out and sign back in. If many people report sound issues, we shall try to address these here. Uh, so, and now I'd like to start our first presenter, Dahlia. Thanks, Katie. So, um, hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, if anyone's joining um, after work today. Uh, so today I'll be presenting about um, sort of what telco edge compute means from SDL partners perspective and um, touch on what do we mean by an edge compute use case and then focus a bit on a specific use case um, which is augmented reality. So um, I guess just a bit of background. So I'm a senior consultant here at SCL Partners. Um, I've been involved in some of the work we've been doing in consulting around um, edge computing uh, for the last sort of 18 to 24 months now. Um, so we've written uh, sort of a few reports on edge computing. You can access, I think, most of these um, for free on our research site. Um, but also now more recently, um, I guess, as edge compute interest grows we've also been um, working with some telecom operators on mainly on the commercials around edge compute and their, their strategy going forward um, so i guess to kick things off um, quite a classic chart you might see which is um, you know that the google search around edge compute has picked up in the last year or so and um, it's gaining interest um, but i guess more importantly there's been some um, there's been some interesting news that's come out on uh, from new startups in this space so you know we'll be hearing from jason um, at mobile edgex a bit later but you've also got players like vapor for example who are um, investing and in deploying edge compute um, locations actively in the us um, there's also been some um, significant investment announced from uh, from established vendors like HPE and there are various initiatives around this space coming from both within the telco industry but um, also outside and you can see there that Microsoft's joined um, the Open Edge Compute uh, initiative and something that um, I guess really sparked interest in the last uh, week or so is AWS's announcement um, with outposts uh, and that has some real implications on I guess the the growth and the um, the demand for distributed cloud and uh, energy compute fits into that so one thing that we get asked a lot is what is the edge and um, I guess edge computing isn't a new concept um, and if you look at it within telcos um, it's been around for a while so you know there is there is an enterprise edge um, and that is uh, that often resides on the the customer CPE and at the moment you know in general there are network functions that are running um, on that CPE but in the future maybe that there are other applications running on that um, and the sort of the distributed compute domain really expands from that enterprise CPE um, but all, uh, and also in the in the central cloud whether it's a private or a, a public cloud there's also the IoT edge and you know many operators are looking at IoT as a new growth area and investing in IoT um, and you can think of the IoT gateway or even the end device as a as an edge compute platform um, and more recently and I guess what we want to talk about today probably in more detail is 
is MEC, um, which originated in the mobile space as mobile edge compute and is now, is now you know, the term multi-access edge compute. And I guess in terms of where this is, um, you know, this is about edge compute resources um, being made available to third parties on the on the um, telcos network. And that, I mean, that could be all the way from the access network to the core network. Um, and it's really dependent on demand and use cases and also what makes sense from the operator's perspective in terms of, sort of economic efficiencies and how viable it is to place um, edge compute locations when it's quite deep in the network. So um, I guess the first poll of the session is um, just a quick one to get an understanding of who's in the room and your and your thoughts in this space. Um, so the question is, how is your organization considering edge computing currently? Um, so if I just launch the poll. Okay, great. So um, yeah, I think the question should be up now and um, feel free to give us your input and your feedback. You can see. Okay, so if we just have a look at the results, um, so I suppose interesting that um, I mean every, most people are exploring edge compute um, to some extent, and it seems that um, either you're at a stage of um, you know still trying to learn and trying to understand what it all means, um, or there are some of you who have some commercial strategy. And I, mean, I guess we can't see whether these are telcos or other. Um, or vendors or others in this space, um, but but yeah, it's great to see that there's some there's some interest there. Okay, so one question that we get asked um, time and time again, especially from telcos, is what are the edge compute use cases? And I suppose a caveat to note um, before we get into this is that edge cloud or edge compute isn't a standalone um, thing. So it should really be thought of as part of a distributed cloud, um, and most if not all applications that will leverage edge compute won't just be residing um, uh, at the edge. So they, the applications and the workloads within them will probably run across um, the device, across um, the edge as sort of an edge compute layer and also the, the cloud layer. Um, I guess um, in terms of what makes an edge compute uh, use case, so there is a sort of sweet spot, and essentially, you need, if you want to look at two sides of an equation, where you can, where you think about the benefits around local compute, and local compute means either on device or on-premise computing, um, and then compare that with cloud compute benefits. Um, the edge, the sort of edge compute or the distributed compute use cases are really in between these, and ideally, you want to leverage benefits that span across the two. Um, what that means in a bit more detail. So here's just um, this is kind of our thinking of what those local benefits are versus the cloud benefits. Um, and and when you think about applications that are currently residing and being run on um, on premises or um, or on devices, most of it is the reason for that is because of low latency, and so um, the application cannot really be running remotely, otherwise it won't work as it's intended to. And there are some applications today that have this requirement, and, uh, and in the future there will probably be more of these as the technology develops. Um, so, you know, augmented reality I'll talk about in a moment, but there's things, um, there's things around, I guess, connected and autonomous cars in the future, um, drones potentially, all these require, um, have very stringent latency requirements. Um, the other two benefits associated with local computing are things like what we've called reduced backhaul. Um, so for some uh, for application developers and providers, they often choose to um, develop applications that will reside on devices or um, on the premises because it can be quite costly, um, both to the application performance, but also um, in terms of financial costs to, to move data back and forth from a remote cloud. And then the last thing is around data localization. So this could be um, due to some security requirements for the application data, data sovereignty, but also resilience. And for that reason, um, the, the, the kind of the compute is run locally. 
So with an edge compute application, you need a mixture of both. Um, so not just these local uh, local compute like benefits, but also the cloud benefits. And as you'd expect, the main I guess one of the main benefits of cloud is scalability and flexibility. Um, and this is um, kind of in terms of being able to move workloads across clouds um, and also scale up and down um, application workloads as needs be. And um, there are some real benefits to this for applications which aren't running at a kind of a steady level um, continuously over time. The other thing, and this is this is really coming out as a real benefit um, that edge compute can um, resolve is around devices. Um, so one thing is by offloading the compute and taking off the device, you can keep devices relatively light. So um, you, know, you don't need to have the sophisticated hardware um, that is used to run applications on a device. Um, but also there are some more subtle benefits like um, reducing kind of the device heating up, um, improved battery life and things like that. And then the, the last thing is that um, you know, you can't have if the application is is being run on devices or is being run on premises, then um, it doesn't make it a very mobile application because the end user has to stay within that vicinity. And so that's um, that's where an, an edge cloud can um, can can help uh, those types of applications. So I think we've covered this in a previous webinar, so I won't go into too much detail on um, telco business models. Um, we've done. Um, so we've published a report on this and we've done some thinking around this. There's, I mean, there's all sorts of business models that a telco can explore when it comes to offering um, edge compute or uh, offering edge, edge compute capabilities. Um, if, as you move from left to right, you it becomes um, a more sophisticated and more um, kind of a, a more difficult business model um, to develop. But also there are, you know, the value increases as you move from simply um, going for a sort of colo or a dedicated edge hosting model where you are um, allocating physical resources for a particular customer, whether it be a, a cloud, sort of an edge cloud provider or a, um, or a content provider or an application uh, or a large application um, provider potentially. Um, as you move furthest to the right, the Atelco would be actually delivering the end-to-end -end solutions and that's where you'd be leveraging the edge compute um, and the, I guess a distributed compute to either offer B2B solutions or um, consumer applications too. So next thing, I guess before I go into the, um, the quick deep dive on augmented reality, uh, there's another poll and this one is about use cases. So the question is which use case will benefit most from edge computing? Um, so here are some options and they're not necessarily, I mean they're definitely not um, exhaustive um, and um, probably not mutually exclusive either, but um, yeah, it'd be good to get your thoughts on what do you, what at least your your organisation has been considering most as a as a real close to killer use case um, for edge compute. Okay. I've been given a thumbs up. So, um, so let me share. Um, so I guess uh, there's a, there's a lot of interest from Internet of Things, and I don't know if everyone's interpreted it in this way, but um, what we thought about here, and the reason why I put kind of bracket sensors, is because this is really about um, using edge compute to um, to kind of benefit. Uh, sort of the massive number of sensors that are associated with the Internet of Things, which aren't necessarily high bandwidth, um, and even they don't, they won't necessarily, necessarily be low latency applications. So that's interesting. And, and video analytics is another one. And that's not surprising because a lot of the these sort of smaller use cases will leverage some level of the video analytics. So when we did the, we did a, I think we put out a poll a month ago now um, on what use case do you want to, do you want us to discuss in this um, webinar? And augmented reality was the top one. So um, hopefully this will be a chance to gauge interest in um, augmented reality, seeing as it's, um, it's not something that's being explored to too much detail currently. So, um, I mean, I'm sure most of us are aware of uh, types of applications associated with augmented reality, but um, some of the things that we've been looking at um, when it comes to applications that could really leverage edge computing, um, there are some AR applications in the consumer space. 
So um, whether that's about gaming and, and there was, you know, uh, a great success with Pokemon Go, which is a, an AR um, gaming um, application. Um, but there's also been some more kind of b 2 b to c applications, which are either being developed or are already um, kind of in the market today. Um, so one of the ones that's that we that you can use as a consumer is are things like the retail applications, um, the AR retail applications that companies like IKEA are putting out. Um, and you can see in the bottom right, um, that's where the, the consumer can um, can select the, the the vendor's product and have a look at what it looks like in their room or maybe um, on themselves if it's a sort of a closed uh, retail outlet. Um, on the top left there, we've got an example of a kind of immersive um, tourist uh, AR uh, application. And, and on the enterprise space, there are also some, some good applications. And on the bottom left, that's just that's signifying one of the ones we're looking at, which is um, a kind of a field force worker or a, a worker using AR headsets um, to help them with a with a particular task where they are trying to maybe repair a piece of machinery and they're able to get information, um, augmented information on the headset uh, and um, and also it could uh, and also potentially a kind of a digital twin, which um, which is all about, I guess, improving productivity of the workforce and and using um, and being able to scale expertise across an organization. So um, hopefully it's it's somewhat obvious why AR applications will benefit from edge computing. If you remember the the list we went through and the the different types of benefits associated with with local and cloud compute. Um, this is a, just a quick diagram. So if we think about that field force worker example, at the moment one of the one of the sort of barriers to adoption with AR is around the the physical weight of the headset and um, Particularly these types of enterprise applications, most of them are using um, HoloLens, which is a fairly heavy piece of hardware, um, and it really reduces how much time a worker can spend, um, you know, using a, a sort of AR application. Um, obviously, if you offload the compute and take it off the device and into the cloud, then you are able to um, to kind of count and solve that problem, um, and the, and. For AR applications like this, you could um, then start to use more lightweight devices. The issue is, you know, you can't use the cloud because of low latency. So, so instead of using the central cloud, um, what Edge Cloud does is bring the application closer to the end user and reduces the latency. There are a few other um, benefits. So, um, you know, we would discuss, discuss this idea of reduced backhaul um, if the application um, is is hosted and is running closer to the end user, then um, there are some costs that can be saved from the from the end customer's perspective around uh, connectivity. And the other thing is that um, I guess one of the um, one of the sometimes the questions we get is what's an edge compute use case versus a 5G use case? And augmented reality is one of those use cases you hear a lot when it when in the 5G discussions. Um, and it's definitely true that augmented reality will benefit from um, higher data rates and increased bandwidth. But the challenge with 5G, and it's something we'll cover in another webinar, is that the um, it will take a long time for, for 5G to be deployed. Um, and it is kind of deep being done in a very gradual process, at least in most markets that we're seeing at the moment. So for an application developer who wants to um, put out a, um, a, 5G, a 5G application, it's very difficult because it relies on a 5G device, which aren't, um, you know, which aren't there on the market today. So what, what Edge Compute enables um, application developers to do is to create applications which are reliant then on 4G um, and LTE plus Edge rather than um, on 5G. Um, so I guess quick note though, although there are, um, well, you know, there's there's great promise associated with Edge Compute and augmented reality, there are some challenges and these are just um, a few of them at the moment anyway. Um, so one of the things is that to leverage Edge Compute, an application needs to be connected on the cellular network um, and um, especially if it's trying to leverage the bene benefits around low latency, it doesn't make sense to go kind of through the whole network um, to get to the, to the um, edge cloud. At the moment, most AR headsets, if not all, don't have SIM cards with them, don't aren't connected to the cellular network. So that's a bit of a kind of a challenge that needs to be overcome and it will require working with the, the 
uh, headset manufacturers to overcome this. Um, the other thing is that, as we mentioned at the beginning, Edge Cloud is a standalone and it's part of a distributed cloud. Uh, at the moment, you know, a kind of a, a scale distributed cloud developer platform doesn't exist. Um, and for application developers to take up Edge Compute, this, this sort of needs to, um, to exist and to, um, to, to enable that. And then the last thing is that the market is still at an early stage. And although there is a kind of a virtuous cycle associated with edge computing and these um, edge computing enabled applications, um, there needs to be demand for the end application before there can uh, be demand for edge compute. So just to wrap up, a um, couple of takeaways, I guess. Uh, edge to edge cloud isn't standalone as I've kind of kept saying throughout the presentation. There's a lot happening in this space and there will continue be, be a lot happening, um, particularly outside of telco at the moment. Um, you know, every couple of weeks or so, there is a big announcement, whether it's from the cloud players or others. Um, for telcos, it's important to consider what business model is right for the organization and to learn, I suppose, from the mistakes. We might touch on that later. Um, you know, there are definite um, similarities with this venture to um, things that telcos have tried before around cloud. So it's important to take those learnings forward. Uh, and then the last thing is that there are, you know, there's lots of potential use cases like augmented reality that can benefit from edge compute, but there are some challenges that need to be overcome. And it's important, I guess, for telcos to be mindful that they are part of a wider ecosystem. Thank you, Dahlia. Now we've got uh, Jason Hoffman, who's chair of Mobile Edge, and he's at Mobile Edge X, and he's going to be talking to us now. So, Jason, to you. Oh, well, no, thank, thank, thank you very much, and thank you, Dahlia, for uh, um, your 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 coverage of everything. You know, we uh, agree with all of it, and, and hopefully, can uh, discuss a couple things a little bit further. Um, and uh, at the very least, uh, tell what our perspective has been, uh, which was, if you go ahead and move to the next slide, we'll, ex we'll, explain, we'll explain that a bit, just in the summary here. Um, so, you know, for us, for, for Mobile Edge X, we um, uh, are a wholly owned subsidiary of, of, of Deutsche Telekom, and we were created to focus on the fundamental application services behind many of these discussed use cases, you know, so to ask questions such as, is there really a back-end relationship between AR and autonomous and many of these types of things that we're, we're talking about. So, you know, as part of an, an operator, you know, we can, you know, dis discuss things from that, that operator perspective. And so when we look at just a couple of points here, um, <clears throat> We, we do work with application creators and device makers. Um, as we said, we were, we were, we were spun out of, out of DT roughly about uh, a year ago. If, if you really look at what our, our mandate continues to be, it's about building and empowering a community of application creators and device makers, network operators, the cloud providers, system integrators, policy makers. And we go and we try to make an, an effort that brings everybody together, uh, you know, in this, in this space. You know, so that, for example, it's not edge versus cloud. You know, as as, as Dolly very quick, quickly, I mean, has very clearly covered, uh, we're dealing with a you know distributed infrastructure. Um, we do this through open source software. You know, so we're inside of things like the Open Edge Consortium as well as um, the telecom infrastructure, um, um, uh, you know, effort that Facebook OCP has been doing, and 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 so on. Now, if we look at the basic sort of issues around why and why now. Um, we do believe that this part of quote unquote edge uh, that we're talking about uh, and what we can contribute is, is part of a value chain that, that accomplishes several things. So the first one is, of course, is we're heading into other Gs, 5G, eventually 6G. Uh, we need to expand the types of devices that exist on mobile networks. Uh, there's still a number of things that can be done around how we secure IoT. Uh, how do we actually do the next generation of content, uh, which is very much how we think about AR uh, and the AR studio efforts. Um, how do we start writing mobile infrastructure for large scale handling of video in uh, and all the things we may want to do to that video as it comes in. Uh, and then for us, when we look at the relationship between 
autonomous devices, devices that need to be mobile on their own, uh, whether it be a drone or a car or anything else, uh, we, we believe that those have the same fundamental back ends as augmented reality. And, uh, you know, we can, we can explain, explain that a bit. Um, and if we look at the why now and, you know, how, how edge should be different, uh, you know, then, for example, LTE and cloud is that, uh, many, many of the larger operators in the space are post cloud in our investments. So the main screen operator investments includes the building of accessible infrastructure. Uh, that was not the case. For example, when smartphones arose, LTE was being rolled out, you know, and cloud was being executed on, you know, within enterprise divisions. Um, there, there, there wasn't a mainstream investment in the building of this type of infrastructure. Uh, and we believe that's, that's, that's the big difference. And we'll explain sort of where that is in the next slide. We can move on. Next slide, please. Uh, so this replicates a bit of what Dahlia talked about uh, as far as being broken down into local compute, on-site edge, centralized clouds, uh, and then the near edge term. And for the near edge term, uh, we're purely referring to uh, the part of an operator infrastructure where if we look at the, the countries that uh, DT operates in, uh, we typically have um, a few data centers that are doing part of a, a transport uh, backbone. Uh, then there's, you know, low tens of data centers where the mobile core sits. There are hundreds to thousands of locations that are access points. And then there are, say, tens of thousands plus, you know, on the, on the, on the tower side. Uh, our interest is in taking that part of the infrastructure footprint and exposing it. And more importantly, exposing it on both ends uh, with two different interfaces uh, and, uh, you know, ma making it easy to use. If we go to the next slide, we'll, we'll show you that, that base sort of model. So the interest here is, again, if we think of device on one end, cloud on the other, now this, this near edge, all of the accessible infrastructure we've been building, you know, initially for ourselves, uh, to actually have two models on, on each end. So on the cloud side, a very standard cloud consumption model uh, with what you'd call, you know, imperative interfaces. So interfaces that allow people to determine how things should be deployed. On the other end of it, which is very much mobile edge access focused, is how are we doing on device software that has a very sort of standard SaaS model so we can standardize across the industry and where that software that's on device is more of a declarative model or is a declarative model where it takes care of the how. So when we look at the two different developer experiences that are needed here, on the device side is a developer experience where the edge is taking care of how things work as a distributed system. On the complete opposite end, when you're looking at more sysops, devops type developers on the cloud side, um, there actually has to be some things where you allow them to determine the how, and it's a different interface. And so accounting for both these interfaces on each end and standard business models on each side and making sure that there's both a cloud native approach as well as a device native approach and that we could start allowing for a certain type of mobility of application backends, you know, within the middle without there being, you know, much, much effort required. Right. So drive, driving exactly towards this. Now, if we go to the next slide, please. Um, the benefits here is we're, we're, we're trying to do a inclusive model, you know, so as, as, as we know, a lot of the conversation in the edge space is very much about infrastructure, but it's not about devices or applications. And it's very much about, um, you know, edge versus cloud versus here versus there. Um, we believe there's an end to end opportunity for everybody uh, in understanding this, that we can open up new revenue streams on the networking side. 
Uh, we can help people that are doing cloud infrastructure actually get a little more distributed uh, faster uh, than they are today. I mean, keep in mind that many of us in the operator space sell transport and facilities and these things even to hyperscale cloud providers. And on the device side, we want to make it so that developers have a very easy, you know, if edge, then I get these additional capabilities. Uh, and to have those capabilities roll out within mobile networks, just like how all capabilities roll out, you know, inside of mobile networks. So how do we give developers on each end a very predictable access uh, to these resources and services that are according to a different model? Uh, and then, of course, you know, for a lot of our sub suppliers in, in the space, um, as you can imagine, if there's actually new revenue streams and uh, a new SaaS model towards device makers, you know, a new thing towards sort of the cloud providers, and we're actually all sort of uh, moving along together, uh, then it actually helps with the general infrastructure modernizations we have to accomplish in the telecom space. So, so we look at this this benefit set. Now, how we're accomplishing this from uh, uh, an open source software perspective, if we go to the next slide, uh, for sort of a software architecture, uh, you know, then it means that, um, you know, as we've gone and discussed this within, you know, the Open Edge Consortium and within TIP, um, you know, we've uh, done, you know, an, an all in-house software base uh, that's written uh, predominantly in Go, but it's got a couple sort of uh, key components to it. Uh, on the device side, um, you know, we're open sourcing all the native SDKs and native API integrations, you know, on the device, you know, that's in there. Uh, and then there's the ability to go and completely understand resources within sort of like a cloud resource manager, um, you know, across both edge cloudlets as well as public cloud. Uh, these, of course, talk to a distributed matching engine and the controller uh, that allows us to go and do that. Um, you know, placement, you know, within this part of the infrastructure and, um, and, uh, and then a, a, a growing portfolio of, of edge services, uh, that sort of live, live, live inside of, and that's both ours as well as third parties. Now, you know, there's a, a couple of comments to make about, you know, this type of needed architecture design, uh, you know, in the enterprise space, uh, people would refer to this as, as, um, you know, a multi-cloud solution combined with, you know, on-device software. Uh, in, in the telecom vendor space, we might call this things like an edge OSS environment. Um, uh, when we look at here, what we do know is we need software on the device, we need software on clouds, uh, we need software that's on top of our, our edge-based infrastructure. Uh, it has to be controlled, there's gotta be a distributed matching engine where we can actually uh, do, you know, various sort of standard type, type trading issues. And uh, we have to actually build out a, a portfolio of edge services that um, are the fundamental backends for many of these these types of use cases. Um, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll I'll just revisit the AR versus autonomous type sort of issue right 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 now in that case. When you look at AR, uh, you're talking about the delivery of like a digital character, right, onto a smartphone, you know, for example, where that character is being mapped into a background that's coming from the video camera on the phone. That's different than streaming a video that takes over the entire screen where you have background and character. So you think of you have a digital asset being streamed in, has to be mapped into the video feed of the camera. Uh, that's occurring in a specific location in the world. It's personalized for you as a viewer and that personalization is understood by everybody else that you're engaged with, either in a multiplayer or collaborative way. If you think about that, the ability to, 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 to do that for uh, a Pokemon um, is a digital asset that's coming in, uh, but the backends that are needed for that from an Ed Services perspective is exactly the same if you want to deliver something physical to that location as well, like a drone or a car. Um, the difference being that um, AR is something we can do today uh, and, you know, completely connected, fully autonomous vehicle, you know, times sort of X uh, does, in fact, require over the latency and some different schemes to be to be in place. Uh, but all that's going to be accounted for within the sort of edge services area. 
Now, if we look at the next slide, the next, and we'll, we'll, if you go to the next slide, please. In these next two slides, I'm just going to flesh out a bit about the software architecture. Nope, sorry, I shouldn't have said next. If you go up to the slide that says mobile servers to support mobile clients. Yep, this one. Um, if we look at here, there's going to be um, two last areas we'll cover. So the first one is going to be what, what's the distributed matching engine and controller and resource manager and these things really, really accomplishing from, from a base capability standpoint. Um, the way we think about it is that we started out the world as things like a static desktop client you know, that sat there talking to a static server in a data center. Um, on the client side, it's predominantly gone mobile. So you have people walking around carrying smartphones and they're sort of going all over the world and they're meant to just work. But even, even, if we, even as we've gone from physical servers to virtual servers on the back end, the back end perspectives tend to stay relatively static and placed within particular sort of geographies. You know, what we then sort of open up from a distributed matching engine and controller perspective in this part of the architecture, it's meant to open up that cloud side of the interface where the backends can be mobile as well. So you can actually take backends from the cloud, clone them, redistribute them within specific sort of areas that are close to sort of end users, uh, and basically just take things to the next step where you had static client talking to static server, mobile client, talking to static server, and mobile client now talking to a mobile server, and we get mobility on both ends of that, that infrastructure. That's the purposes of, of that. And then finally, if we go to the next slide, please, um, and, and the final content slide, is then when we sort of flush out the edge services area, um, there, there ends up being sort of three three base categories that, that, that come out. Uh, the, the first one is largely around sort of operational issues. So that's how do we begin exposing a number of capabilities we have within our networks, uh, largely around you know device connectivity, how do we uh, assure the software that goes on them, how do we do a set of assurance and security services on cellular you know, that are unique, uh, and then the other two categories of, of, of services, the first one around augmented control systems is where um, latency uh, comes into play. And here we're not so much looking to move control systems from a device to the edge because you always have to have software on a device. This is there. But our interest is in what would the edge services uh, need to be to support large populations of devices. So it's not about how we support one car, but how we support 10 million cars you know, in a given geography. It's not just about how we connect one drone, it's how we actually do unmanned flight management you know, across many drones. Uh, you know, how do we actually have additional services that help people that are building control systems manage a population of control systems? Uh, and uh, that, that's a bit different. And then the other ones we, we broadly categorize as sort of data and compute offload services. And, and these can range from augmented reality content delivery uh, to much more sort of advanced video sort of post-processing within sort of the network. Okay. And then for us, that concludes the Mobile Edge part. So thank you very much. Hi. <clears throat> thank you, Jason. Hi, this is for Layla, um, director, uh, consulting director at STL Partners. Um, Hi, thank you both, um, Dahlia and Jason. For that. What I wanted to do now is a little bit um, open up the conversation to the audience um, and invite them to uh, set their questions. We already had a couple of questions, so it would be great um, if, if any of you want to add to those questions. Um, I think um, here with some questions coming in now, uh, I'll just kind of kick off on the first one or two. Um, there's some questions really that are coming up. I've noticed two or three now. One um, from Karen Hewitt and another question just come in that's asking about the relationship that you anticipate between um, the mobile, or oh, sorry, the operators, telco operators, fixed mobile operators offering their edge compute and the, the cloud providers, so the hyperscale cloud providers. And I guess the questions are around 
are they um, a threat, an opportunity? What is that relationship? What could that look like? Um, and and then I'll, I'll let you answer that one first, and there's some more specific ones on um, some of the recent announcements. So can I just maybe start with you, Jason? How do you see the, the relationship between the cloud providers and the um, Telco Edge um, operations working? Oh, no, yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I mean, what I see from the cloud provider space right now is, um, and, and, and the, current, the current cloud providers are a bit different. So if we look at, you know, the recent announcement, the announcements from uh, AWS, um, there's clearly an interest for them to be a infrastructure provider uh, in, you know, these near edge locations. You know, so putting racks of AWS outposts, uh, you know, inside of there. Uh, they do have the experience of doing that uh, directly themselves, uh, mainly to the U.S. government and then their, 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 their China footprint. So it's not terribly new for them. Um, but as we know, um, being a supplier into this part of the telecom infrastructure um, is, a, is a challenging business in general, um, and, and it usually requires the involvement of system integrators and, and other sort of capabilities in there. So it's to be seen um, how, how well Amazon can sort of step into being a on-premise infrastructure system vendor, uh, you know, to the operator space. I mean, somewhere right now where HPE is very dominant, in the footprint, uh, Nokia, Ericsson, you know, Huawei provide, you know, sort of, you know, you know, the, those, those types of systems in there. So it's pretty clear that Amazon does want to play in that space. Um, you know, we'll see how turnkey uh, it can it can become. We'll see how they deal with, uh, you know, the, the, the requirements that are very often put onto that type of infrastructure that is largely contractual. Um, you know, meaning that that. You know, very often the vendors indemnify us on the operator side. Um, and um, yes, that's that's a that's a two D seen uh, type type sort of effort. Now, um, the thing that's somewhat disconcerting about it is just uh, that that is a full blown Amazon control plane. You know, where now their their control plane is basically sitting sitting within there. Um, if you look at the other Two large cloud providers, Microsoft and Google. Um, Google has the largest SD WAN uh, out there. Uh, Microsoft's the second largest. Amazon doesn't really have, you know, sort of the same capabilities. Those SD WAN footprints are, you know, globally going to end up in sort of like the hundred of sites. And I think they've, you know, there, there's there's intersection points there where there's you know, more more collaborative sort of things to do. Uh, and then, of course, Microsoft's been doing things, you know, like the AWS Outpost, uh, but it's been, you know, things like Azure Stack through sort of like typical channels. But again, it's the same sort of comments, you know, it's to be seen, uh, you know, what type of infrastructure provider there are within operators. You know, and so, you know, there, there, there's there's uh, some things there to figure out still, I guess would be sort of the short, the short version of it. Um, okay. And uh, we'll see. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Jason. Very briefly, Dahlia, would you add anything to, to Jason's point regarding regarding that relationship and how that that that, that could evolve? Um, I agree with Jason in that things are yet to be seen, and there's, um, and I suppose especially with the the big cloud players, um, you can never underestimate the ambition. But at the same time, I, I mean, one thing that we've we've said throughout this webinar is that. Edge cloud isn't something distinct and isn't something that's new and it's part of a distributed cloud. So I think I don't know to what extent the relationship um, and, and the dynamics between operators and cloud providers will differ in the edge cloud world versus the, the current cloud world. And um, some, I guess if you look at the past, some operators had, you know, big ambitions in um, competing with AWS and the like head on initially, but um, you know, there's, they've all kind of scaled back, and, and there's a um, there's a kind of relationship there that exists, and there is a role for operators, um, both in terms of 
doing what they do best in connectivity and um, and you know there are more there are opportunities to uh, bring value uh, from a connectivity standpoint in the distributed cloud um, ecosystem but also I guess as a maybe for some for specific operators um, in being a, um, a solution provider or maybe a service provider particularly in the, um, in the enterprise space thank you um, I'm conscious we've got a lot of questions I'd like to run through some I think this one could be a little bit quicker the response um, and I think this one will direct to Jason a question from um, Edel Curley, which is, uh, is, is the open source available yet for developers? I think that's specifically relating to uh, your description of open source associated with Mobile Ajax. Uh, yeah, we, we've been, um, um, it, it's, it's been available to a, a, a small, smaller set of developers. So, you know, like a dozen ish, dozen -ish companies that we're, we're working with largely to just pipe, pipe clean what that process is going to be. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we're looking to make that more widely available as soon as, as soon as we can. So if there's, there's interest, just feel free to contact us and we can work on access. Okay. Thanks. Um, moving on. Um, I'm just going to pick one of some of the other questions we've got down here. There's a question from Michael Dennis, which is, uh, I'll direct this one first to you, Dahlia. Not an easy one. Uh, well, this is this is about mobile edge. Uh, it says mobile X. I assume mobile edge X. <clears throat> which sector, or I'll expand that to which sectors do, do, do you think will be the first to benefit from? Um, I, I assume, Michael, you actually meant mobile edge X. So perhaps I'll, let me start with you again, Jason, because you're talking to more of those developers and you've got a sense of which are the sectors, the verticals that are likely to see the benefits first. Uh, well, I mean, the, the, the ones that will see the benefits first is largely consumer mobile gaming, um, first, first, you know, meaning there's a, a set of, of consumer needs uh, that are a bit different than enterprise needs and industrial needs. So, um, and if you look at what, what consumers are interested in, it's basically things around gaming, uh, you know, diff different devices they're consuming. Uh, and, uh, you know, largely handling a couple of sort of video workloads on there that are largely have to do with, with new security cameras that people are doing. So, you know, there's, uh, um, a lot of interest in sort of exploring in the consumer space because you can do that right now. Uh, right. and, um, you know, the enterprise space and industrial space is slightly longer product development cycles. Okay, uh, would you add anything to that, Dahlia? Yeah, I, I mean, um, I definitely think there is some interest and there's some benefits um, related to gaming and the like. Um, I suppose one of the challenges though in the consumer space is scale and um, uh, it's a difficult, well, it depends how the, um, how, it, how the, you know, the business model works with the content provider, um, but I guess there's a, um, there's a challenge in the value proposition where, you can only until edge compute is scaled and you can um, target all consumers across all different networks as well um, there yeah. is a kind of um, a scalability issue and that's why I think you know there is actually a maybe a more ready um, kind of demand from enterprise because it doesn't have those issues as much I think I mean yeah, actually I, the, I, question, the question was posed yeah. you know what, the post of is for mobile edge X. Yeah. Now, for, for mobile edge uh, mm -hmm. It may be a different story. It may actually be that enterprise opportunities that don't require that cross operator um, coverage. Yeah, um, they'll, they'll just they'll, those the the enterprise opportunities are going to be in a the ones that emerge there that are you know doable or you know really what's typically called sort of campus type deployments. You know, so you know if you're covering a you know a given geography, you know there there's there's some things that can be done in a relatively you know short short sort of period of time you know i'm just speaking to the things where you know for example if you're going to if you're going to do something with the edge with a car maker um it, it's going to be five years before anything shows up in a car that somebody's driving just on normal product development cycles so when you look at you know even in sort of some of those enterprise use cases the reality is it's their three to five year projects on their own um, and um, and it's going into you know the typical layers that one goes and executes on those types of deals. 
uh, they, 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 can, they can take a while. Um, I think the, the, the campus type deployments, you know, where you're covering just a building or just a factory, and you're doing a, a couple of use cases that are very sort of focused on there, those are executable on the same types of time frames as some of the consumer cases are. But 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 it's difficult to just broadly use the enterprise enterprise word because there can yeah. be a, a seven year spread in, okay. in, in just execution time. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna just touch on another couple more questions while we've got the time. Um I, I think there was a there's a question um here about um from John Cunningham on, on the compute offload. Um, is that an IaaS hardware software offering provided by Mobile Edge X, or is it more orchestrating edge applications across um, the uh, Telco Edge Cloud and Hyper Cloud? So I, I guess the, the question is, um, you know, to what extent is is what you're providing well, a uh, offering yeah, we, or, or is we, an we, orchestration? Yeah, we, we felt that the missing piece was orchestration. And so okay. we, we handle that that orchestration side of things. I mean, I, I think the, you know, what we've what we've tried to even avoid on, uh, you know, the the, the the Deutsche Telecom side of things and, and the, other, the other operators we work with is, you know, the, the the truth is is we have existing infrastructure resources in there. So we already have, you know, test VNFs deployed on Kubernetes clusters. There's OpenStack installations. You know, there's VMware installations. We have we have enough infrastructure to go and you know get get some of these initial use cases going. Uh, and edge in many ways is an orchestration issue and a business model issue more so than yet another infrastructure that we need to put together. Picking up on that, I don't, I'm on a popular question that um, Abed Hussein um, raised, which is: you know, Is there a clear proven case for edge monetization? And I think behind that, it's it's you know. What is the business model from an operator's perspective, and, and who is actually going to pay them for it? Maybe I'll, I'll let you start with that, Dali, and then we can hand over back to Jason. Um, I mean, whether it's proven, I mean, it depends how you define edge. So, you know, we had that slide around the edge exists already, if you think about enterprise edge and IoT edge. If we're talking about MEC specifically, um, well, no, it, it's not proven because, um, not really being commercialized yet but um i suppose there is real we've seen hints at real demand and, and jason's probably closest to this with the discussions they've been having from the application developers so there is a um, a real commercialized need um who pays really depends so um i, I mean yeah it, it all comes down to, to the business model especially from the telco's perspective so you can, you know, there is an option or there is one way of using the edge, which is around um, a, more akin to a CDN. And that has a specific and fairly established business model associated with it um, and a kind of a business case associated with it, which is why tel a telco would do that. And then you know, obviously there's a, there's a kind of more enterprise uh, platform based business model. Um, so I think it, I mean, it's, it's not a great answer, but it depends, um, but there is proven demand at least, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna. I mean, we've got lots of great questions coming in. So, um, Jason, I'm gonna actually move on to the next one here, uh, which I think is from Peter Brame, and it's an interesting question because he's asking, yeah, for the position of an, a developer or an application provider today, you know, why are they gonna move away from what they they know already, the public cloud and, and the application stores? What is gonna entice well, we them to, to make that yeah. that that move? Yeah, we don't we don't think they are gonna move away. So, and we're not suggesting they, they do. Um, if you look at those developers today, um, there's the guys that actually do the development on the device where they're typically working in an ARM environment uh, on an operating system, say like Android, uh, and they, they tend to have frameworks and tool sets that are specific for the, the on-device world. Right? If you then go to their back-end teams, they have a back-end team. And the back end team is doing all the development of the back ends and the DevOps aspects on the cloud itself. So within each and every company we, we speak to is at the very least the front end people and the back end people. The back end people are handling the cloud side and the front end people are, you know, handling all, all the on device development. Um, 
you know, what we're suggesting is that within the device world, uh, you know, we, we actually have uh, SDKs and native integrations and things like, like Android and, and, and other mobile operating systems that allow them to actually get additional capabilities in the infrastructure that's in between the device and in between the cloud. Some of those capabilities include moving some of the workloads from the cloud into the edge on a temporary basis, depending on like what people are doing on those devices. It's not sort of like one, one or the other. So it's just one of these types of things where right now the on-device guys have a back-end team that is making the back-end work and they cover all the how. And we're just trying to give those on-device developers a software solution as well that covers the how for them and opens up additional capabilities in the middle uh, that is meant to work together with, with the cloud backends. Okay, thanks. Um, just another question now. Uh, read out this one back to, to Dahlia. From a sort of an industry perspective, if we sort of look at telco industry and telco's industry in, uh, exploration of um, telco, uh, of, of edge computing, what does success look like, say, in 2020 and in 2025, sort of at a high level, if, if we as an industry are going to really um, make something of edge compute. What would you say, the ind indication, what, how would you measure success in 2020 and 25? Um, well, I suppose what, even though you can have an industry perspective, I guess various operators um, are inherently different. And if we think about 2025, um, those differences may not, but may, become greater. So what I'm talking about is sort of the difference between a network operator and a service provider and, and a solution provider. Um, and, you know, there are there are different benefits associated with edge compute for those three different roles. So if you think about a network operator who is focused on kind of network performance, KPIs, or maybe or, and costs and reducing costs and optimizing, then the, the benefit, the real benefit from edge compute you know, I'll, I'll probably similar, like I said, to to CDN today, and to be able to um, manage the um, the load on the the network efficiently. Whereas, if you think about a service provider, um, so kind of like a you know retail consumer provider, the the edge provides them with an opportunity to um, to sort of you know have these maybe two sided business models, or at least be able to enrich their consumer offering, um, and um, you know. I guess similar to what they do today, but augment not only not only by bundling um, uh, content, but also enhancing that content through um, through edge compute and through the other capabilities. And so success is more associated with market share there and, and ARPU and and you know numbers of partners and amount of um, content that they're able to provide to their end consumers. And then if you think about a, so a solution provider, then you know that's where it's more. Um, it's more about end-to-end -end solutions and whether they're, they're horizontal or vertical solutions and some operators, I guess, are trying to really invest in vertical plays, then the, then the KPI there is, is new revenue um, in particular. So, I, yeah, I think it, I think it def depends, but um, hopefully that sheds some light across the three. Okay, I'm, I'm conscious of time. We've got probably time for this last question. There's a question here from Shaitali saying Gupta. Um, which comes back to one of the earlier polls where we saw that um, IO2 sensors was seen as a, a top choice. Um, and, and we haven't heard so much about IoT sensors um, from, from Jason or, or yourself. So Jason, how does MobileJX fit into um, more of the IoT use cases? Uh, well, I mean, one of, the, one of the most commonly deployed things in some of our edge use cases today is fundamentally what you call an IoT gateway. Uh, many of the IoT sensors that are out there are not IO intensive, so they're not generating a tremendous amount of data. Uh, right now, they tend to have a relatively smaller, you know, sort of data footprint. So a lot of, a lot of our um, IoT work is on helping scale some of the gateways in different countries, but then it's actually um, more applying a lot of the assurance and security aspects that we have on cellular uh, to the IoT space. Um, and so when you look at a lot of the, you know, at least what we've identified is, you know, the sort of, you know, joking term of Internet of Trash 
is is very common, you know, particularly in sort of the consumer space right now. In that, you know, there uh, there are abandoned devices, abandoned sensors, things that are not properly upgraded from a software perspective. There's no guaranteed integrity of software sort of updates and and and, and the like. So we do believe there. Are Everything around sort of the assurance and security services is more critical to the IoT space right now. And how we deploy those IoT gateways into this part of the infrastructure is sort of there as well. And then as we start heading into much more sort of data IO intensive type IoT things, uh, you know, then sort of data and compute offload type capabilities show up. Um, but, they, but they tend to be a pretty large, pretty small bandwidth type type workloads right now. Okay, thanks. I think we're sort of top of the hour now. So um, I'd just like to say, look, thank you very much, um, Jason and Dahlia, for your presentation. And thanks, everyone, for joining the webinar. And thanks to those of you who have um, submitted your questions. I'm, apologies, we weren't able to address them all, but we got through quite a few of them. Um, this course is available online as a recording, so do invite your friends. And um, uh, thanks again uh, for, for setting it all up and, and running it, Katie. Um, uh, look forward to inviting you all to our, our next series of webinars. Thank you. Thank you very much.